thank you for this week's coffee talk. Um, you have your screen shared there and all, and your title is Responsible Data Use, Value Sharing and Value Alignment. So I won't delay any longer, Rahan, or we'll be eating into the time, and I'll hand it over to you to get started. Perfect. Thanks, Carol. Uh, so uh, as Carol mentioned, uh, today the, the kind of topic of discussion would be responsible data use, and two, two concepts within, within this value sharing and value alignment. And for those who don't know me, I'm Rehan Iftikhar. I'm a lecturer at School of Business at Minos University. So let's dive into what is value sharing and why should we study it? So like the value sharing concept, all of you would be familiar with it, is to kind of have an equitable distribution among data contributors and stakeholders. So like we we all know that data doesn't come from one source or, or one, one creator, one contributor, and there are multiple entities, individuals who, who make the data what it is. And then that data should be, the value coming out of that data should be shared back in, in a fair manner. Uh, so one example of this would be our, so we have in, in the last few months, uh, known a lot of large language models like chat gpt bard and all of them are based on data which was produced over a long period of time by different contributed creators and as far as i'm aware there was nothing in terms of giving or sh sharing that value back in terms of what for example revenue chat gpt is generating and how the, how much the revenue is based on the content which was created and how much it is then the AI code and development which was then done afterwards. But a lot of data was created by huge many people and they would never get any compensation for that, most likely. And that's what we in IBI and, and me as a researcher want to change that the companies who are benefiting out of the data used should share back the value with the content creators. And how how they should do it is, 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 a, is a topic I'm very interested in. And uh, one of the, the things which we have learned from retail uh, is this concept called zero party data. Zero party data refers to any information which a user willingly, willingly provides to a company or organization. And mostly whenever a zero party data is generated in, in retail, the value is shared back, but, and it's not across the board. It's some, some retailers do it, some, some don't. Then outside of retail, again, some companies do it, some don't. But the value is shared back in more or less three different ways. So one is personalized experience. So for example, when a user would uh, share their preference and interest, they would receive tailored recommendations, content or products offering. Then monetary benefits. So for example, they might receive vouchers or exclusive discounts which are not available to, to other users. So this creates a sense of value for users that encourages them to provide more information, more data and more accurate information. And the other things like uh, exclusive access to, to some events or even to a new technology and, and those kind of things. So in, in this case, we, we see a kind of a good, good way in which uh, uh, users are sharing data with the company and then company is sharing value back. But this is also not very fair as of now, the value, because what we don't have is a very good way of monetizing the value of the data. So, um, a data could be worth nothing or data could be worth a lot, but when we don't know as a company uh, that what the data is worth, we're not able to share that value back in, in, a, in a fair way. So that that is something which can be done even in, in, in the use case of zero party data, but we, we already see that, that there are mechanisms out there which, which work and in which there, there is a possibility of sharing the data back or sharing the value back based on, on, on data share. 
And the other thing uh, which I want to kind of uh, talk about is value alignment. So value alignment would be in terms of uh, when we share data as, as a user with, with a company or as a company with another company, one important consideration should be if that company data use aligns with ethical, legal, and social consideration of the contributor or, or the user. And then understanding the implication of that data use and ensuring that there's a value alignment from all the different perspectives, from the creator's perspective, generator's perspective, and, and the user's perspective. So this brings us to this concept of data value chain in which we, we consider the, the whole value chain. And as we see in other, like in, in a supply chain, that now nowadays companies focus a lot on, for example, the suppliers and suppliers of the suppliers being compliant to, to certain standards. And the same should be done in, in, in the data value chain that the whole value chain should have some, some standard to comply with and a company or an organization should only share, get data from the, the companies which comply with those certain standards. And then, then another thing in terms of value alignment, again, the, this comes from uh, the, the talks we, we had uh, yesterday and today, evaluating the potential risk and benefits associated with data collection analysis and, and sharing, and then seeing is it worth getting the data from a particular company which is not up to, to the standard which one company is, uh, or for a user then to, to share data with, with a certain company which don't have the, the, the value alignment in terms of ethical, legal, and social consideration with, with that user. So, so these are, are, are the things uh, which, which are critical in terms of responsible data use, fair data use, and we have been having these discussions uh, in, in the last two days about open data, data value. And I just wanted to kind of give it more tangible form in terms of how, how we can do it and what concepts we, we need to study and the, how these concepts then can be applied uh, to actually fulfill this kind of uh, dream, let, let's say, of uh, a society in which uh, like the, the value is, is shared in, in a fair and a fair manner based on, on, on the data. And yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm happy to discuss this further. And if, if you want to get in touch to, to look in, into, into these concepts in more detail, uh, please get in touch in, in my email. And you can also kind of get in touch through IVI's digital retail portal. So yeah, that's it from my side. Open to discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Rahan. Thanks very much. Um, I can open the um, floor to questions now, if anyone has any. Well, I'm not too sure if there's a question or a comment yet, but even the term value sharing, I suppose, is it's already maybe a step in the right direction of maybe changing people's mindsets around this and um, kind of moving from just that data sharing type of um, discussions that have been going on. So do you think, Rayhan, kind of even the terminology that we use around this could make a difference in kind of um, moving people towards this acceptance of value sharing that you can't, you know, that there has to be something given back, as you said, to the the, the content creators or the, the contributors? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. And we, we have seen this uh, with the, kind of the environmental sustainability uh, where now companies kind of give back carbon credits and, and those kind of things. So like all of this started with, with this acceptance that as, as a society, we cannot produce, we cannot keep producing carbon or we cannot keep uh, doing this thing in, in, in a certain way. So I think the same is with, with the data that we can't keep exploiting users, generators, creators, and give them nothing in return. So in, the, in that case, in, in an environmental sustainability case, we are exploiting environment and giving nothing back. 
And in this case, we're exploiting uh, creators, generators of, of data, and then give, give nothing back. So the, well, the, the terms, the terminology, and just having this discussion creates this space in which we make it kind of uh, affirming for, for companies or, or make it mandatory for companies, like, let's say, that they, they talk about this and they implement this. Other, otherwise, if as a society, we don't create this pressure, nothing is going to happen. And I think the pressure was created with the sustainability. And of course, a lot has to be done in, in that area. But at least now there is the recognition that all the, within all the companies that this is something they need to do. And we need to create same kind of pressure. And with using these terminologies, with having this discussion that they have to share the value back and share it in a, in a, in a fair way. Yeah, no, I, I think that it is a, a really interesting topic and uh, thanks for the presentation. And I really like the retail example because it allows you kind of, to, you know, to really think it out of maybe examples in, in other sectors, in other areas as well. So, yeah, the retail example is a great one. Thanks, Rahim. Thanks, Denise. Yes, Marcus. Yeah. Yeah, so and I also thanks Denise for the question and thanks Rehan for the, the, the topics and kind of the ideas uh, around this. I think it fits very well into the empowered data governance uh, topics where we also talk about data um, values. So in, in that program and in the community of practice working groups, so that wasn't a question yet. So it's just kind of also some ideas uh, around this because you just mentioned Rehan, we need to increase the pressure or keep the pressure on that data or value is actually shared mind this wouldn't that maybe even require maybe an other ownership concept because at the moment uh, we we consent data almost forever to be used for that purpose so uh, maybe if it would be like that actually uh, consent and uh, usage rights are expiring. If we basically go to this kind of concept that really data stays with the creator so that we actually own the data, but we can uh, give a license, a kind of a consent for a certain usage period. Um, and then basically it defaults again, it's expired. And with this, with this, we could actually increase the pressure. So because I think it's extremely difficult to understand the value, what companies, what organizations, or what the society benefits from it. Uh, over time, we learn that certain whatever profiles on LinkedIn are extremely valuable, that data. Uh, and so basically, if we then withdraw the consent to this, we can have or we demand a little bit more on sharing than a two euro uh, discount somewhere or a, a free voucher or something uh, or nothing, basically, sometimes in some cases, so that we basically really change the ownership model the data stays with the with the person, and he or she basically decides how long someone can use it. No, I, I completely agree. And I think this is kind of a really good idea in this sense that we make the content time bound, and what what would that facilitate is that also this. Uh, for example, a company was using data and was not getting a lot out of it for, for whatever reason, and then suddenly we have. The chat GPT, and now the company is getting a lot out of it. So now, if everybody like OpenAI kind of comes back to each creator in, in what way, shape, or form, and now asks for permission without giving money back, nobody would say yes, almost. So, so that is, I think, with the time out concept you 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 shared, when the company is getting a lot of benefit out of it. And then they have to request that consent. They would have to share value. They have to kind of in terms of monetary value or then otherwise there could be any other subjective thing like a company commits to something or, or, or other thing, whatever the, the user wants. But if it's time bound, and I think that's something which should be quite like uh, looked into f further that if we make it time bound, it really puts pressure especially for those companies who are now making a lot of, out of that data. 
Yes, and I think there's um, kind of, it's a little bit short-sighted on all the regulations and all this, that it's basically, it starts with the cookie uh, consent. Uh, first of all, it's too complex uh, to even understand what we really kind of uh, consent there. Uh, second, it seems to be when I pressed once the button and I don't uh, remove the, co the cookies, it's forever there. So why is it not? Because all contracts usually have an expiry date or a certain time limit, a year or so. Why is it not like this with consent? And the same with DNA data, genomics data, with really important data. We don't know what's in 20 years, what we can do with all of that data. Um, like, uh, and, and so it's really important that basically we, as data creators, we have ownership of that forever, basically, and we just license it out or, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. License it out for a particular time period, because as you said, technology evolves. We don't know what that data is worth. So that data could be worth nothing today, but then a, another technology comes in, another uh, way of analyzing that data, and that data is worth a lot. So, and then we have consented based on our valuation today, but that valuation could, could change a lot in the coming future, yeah. Any other questions? Anyone else? Then otherwise, like basically, I just see the room at uh, the, in the Innovation Valley Institute. It seems that almost no one has a coffee. Uh, so uh, like basically the whole coffee talk is the idea to discuss a topic over coffee or tea or uh, water. Uh, so yeah, like I have that as well. So and <laughs> half of my cup is gone. <laughs> so, like, uh, <laughs> But I can I can make a question, um, Ryan, and uh, th thanks for the presentation. And actually, uh, I think uh, because uh, internet changed the paradigm about the data. Because uh, before you, for example, newspapers, uh, you were supposed to buy newspaper to get uh, news to read some news. And uh, of course, still there are some subscription that you can have. But in, in general, if you want the news, you just go to the internet and you find any kind of news. And uh, also the uh, paradigm of open data that is uh, becoming more and more important in, in Italy. I don't know if it's here in Ireland, but in, in Italy, there is the, that road, the, the law, the regulation is uh, that everything is open by default. So unless you restrict the use of the data that you are publishing your website, is open data. So you don't have to say that the data in your website is open data because it's uh, considered by default is open unless you say the opposite and uh, actually therefore the, the opposite should be or is a very specific data like uh, military data or uh, something that is very critical so everything is open and uh, this of course creates opportunities but also poses some challenges and uh, so because uh, one idea one idea kind of the limit could be okay let's open everything to everybody and uh, could be this could be an easy model. I don't know if it works, but uh, yes. What what is your thought in in these regards? Should we open everything to everybody? No, I, I, I'm a big fan of open data, and open data is is really really good for uh, innovation first of all, and for creating opportunities. But the thing is, again, like we as a company, you exploit that open data and you create something out of it. Then it's your responsibility to give back, not uh, like, I think there are two ways of giving back. You give back in terms of sharing back data, sharing back that whatever you did with that data, anything that came out of that, like, so that is something and other the monetary value or any other value. So I'm not against uh, having open data. Open data is, is really good for in innovation, I think, as we should make data, as open as we can, but then on the other side, we should kind of hold any entity responsible for the value they're generating from the data to share it back. So, so that's the concept I, I'm kind of advocating for, is you have a lot of data, you, you do whatever you want with it, but when you start creating money out of it, that's the time you need to share, share that value back to the to the, content creators, generators, and, and so on. And by the way, this is why there are the 
different uh, Creative Commons licenses with the different levels to you do whatever you want, you give credit back to the to the original provider, or you can kind of share a like that of course you if you do something you share in an open way as it was the the, the original open data uh, generated. So of course there are different ways of using the data and the sharing and in the, to 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 other to others what the product the product that you you create with that data. Yeah, and I would not even stop at that in number. So that's the legal aspect of it, that you, you have that kind of a license and then you are legally bound, for example, to, to do something. But uh, I think a responsible company should go one step ahead of it. Even if they're not required by law, they should do it because that's ethically right. Moral, yeah. But that alone is difficult, I think, <laughs> because if you have a commercial company and you have shareholders in there, you need to principle maximize the value out of this. And you can't just um, share <laughs> um, or um, donate money somewhere around this, or there are certain bounds. Bound, mm -hmm. So it's a very difficult concept for commercial companies. And I think we also need to differentiate on, for example, value which is created for societal good and the other one for commercial uh, benefits and there certainly a difference on on this and open uh, data and open sharing in that sense marco what you mentioned that probably works very well when we create something for societal good uh, but as soon as it turns into something more commercial value where a company or a group of of people or organizations benefit monetarily from this then it becomes a really problem case in that kind of who, who actually shares the value who, who benefits from it and all of these questions Marianne what you raised yeah Marcus and even even on that the companies the commercial entities they didn't want to to go do anything for sustainability as well and then as a society you can get pressure <laughs> they they have to do it and, and I think of course it would not be easy as you said it's it's very difficult task and I'm no way saying that we, we say this and the company will start doing it. They would not. They, mm -hmm. they, would, <laughs> they would not until you kind of make them do it by either by, by law or by societal pressure. So, uh, and everything you can't put in law because of course uh, it, it, there's a limit to, 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 to law as well. So the other thing is the societal pressure. And for example, those kind of things, you only buy from those companies who, who have who make it clear that this is how they use data. The same way we do now with ethical responsible companies in terms of uh, sustainability, that we, some of us only buy from companies who, who have that uh, policies in terms of sustainability, green companies and, and so on. So same could be for, for data use and how they exploit data. Yeah, and also the understanding of the value of that created data. And uh, like you said, okay, we can't put everything in laws, but typically our society works with these agreements. And like I know when you have a, from a supermarket a membership card and you get a euro off a certain product, uh, that's a tiny benefit what you're getting for a huge amount of value which can be created when you put the, the value, the, the data together. And I think that understanding and that agreement that needs to be really, first of all, understood. Many of them don't, don't even read really the membership application for such a, 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 a club card, a loyalty card, um, and, and what you actually really sign up for is forever basically almost to to, uh, to to use that data and that needs to be changed somewhere around the understanding that it becomes really kind of the normal market what we have and we have something we can license it we own it or someone owns it and so on and particularly when we go then to health data uh, genomics data it's a lot of future value we don't know yet what we can do with all of that yeah and I just wanted to share one, one thing I, I heard over the radio. So now they have started, again, I'm, I'm doing a lot of sustainability examples, but they have attributed value to, to a whale, which is alive and what kind of impact it has on, on an environment. And the value of a life 
live whale, which was uh, calculated by, by some scientists, it was around 5 million. So this is how much, for example, that, that is worth to the environment and everything. And, and we would, in no, no one of us would pay that amount for, for whale. But similarly, as you said, our data has so much value and we don't know that. Like we, we get one euro off, we think, oh, wow, we, 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 got, we got, got something out of it. But the value is so huge that we don't even know it. And even us who work with data and, and have some understanding of it, even we don't know exactly how much monetary value can be assigned to it. And I think that's really what we should be doing in terms of tangible value attributed to, to different data. Yeah, and I know Carol probably like I know we are almost on the the, the hour. So, but just kind of two um, two examples as well as one of the the, the contactless uh, payments, like that value of just even the transactional data uh, is 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 huge, uh, and I think it pays for all of the transactions on this. And uh, so, and the other one, a topic which we certainly can't discuss now, uh, is risk associated with value. So that might be actually for one of our future coffee talk that balance between value and risk and how we cater for this in complex value, data value chains. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Marcus. I'll hand over to Carol now. Thanks very much, Rehan, again. And thanks, everyone, for the questions. Just a reminder, guys, we have the IBI Summit next Thursday. If you haven't registered, um, please do. The details are on the website. And, um, yeah, we look forward to seeing everyone. Thank you. And thanks Bye. again, Rehan, for the presentation today.